I realized it was, I just love working with kids. I love the people that were working with the kids. Um, it seemed to be a lot more fun. Um, it was serious, but it was a lot more fun uh, when I was a senior medical student. But we did 12 weeks of surgery, in which I found I just loved the process. And the pressure's on no matter what time of day or night it is to fix that person. So that's very rewarding. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Come on in. Hi, I'm Al. Dr. Walton. Hi, Lori. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Cameron. Hi, Cameron. So uh, it does look like a cyst. It was sort of a big branchial cleft cyst. I think the best thing to do would be to remove it. Um, you're fully asleep, uh, under an anesthetic. We don't need your help to do the operation, <laughs> nothing like that. Um, and then uh, we uh, make an incision over the area, bring it out, and then obviously free it from any of the structures around. So the incision at this point would be, um, would be something probably about that big. You can sort of see I can move it all over. Um, so that's good. It means, uh, you know, it shouldn't be, uh, um, it isn't stuck down to some, some, of the, some of the things we see will have like almost roots. Um, and you sort of have to tease all those roots out around things. So you don't have any roots. <laughs> An important part of what I do is being able to talk to people and reassure them. Uh, as I say, sometimes I'm just a surgical psychiatrist, you know. Uh, and, and I think that's an important part of the job, is reassuring the parents that uh, Johnny or Susie are okay. 9.15? They were 20, 27 weeks. And Logan's almost 10 pounds, and Liam's 7.13. They both had double hernias. A little bit of fluid around there. You can sort of see that little bluish. That's normal. Those incisions, I think, will be hard to find in the future. Yeah. They're good healers. They look great. The parents see that you're the expert, and there are some things that are clearly not surgical, and we say that. We say, well, this isn't a surgical problem. You need to see your family doctor. That's the neat thing about surgeons is you can be, you should be a good doctor, a physician, but you can also operate. And I think a good surgeon can do both those things. What's this? He's an owl in Harry Potter. Oh, him. right. I've heard about him. Have you read the Harry Potter books? Yeah, I'm on the fourth one. Oh, neat. Aren't they good? OK. The, uh, that cyst that's in the spleen seems to be getting bigger and causing you more and more yes. pain and discomfort. And um, so we're going to have to remove that. Uh, the, where the cyst is in the spleen is an area where we, um, it isn't just sort of hanging off the spleen, yeah. it's sort of right in the middle of the spleen, so it means we're gonna have to take the whole spleen out. But we'll assess that when we look at it with the laparoscope. You wipe balance? Yes. We're gonna put in the telescope into her tummy and look at the spleen. Well, the spleen allows filtration of the blood, uh, catches some types of bacteria. Um, it helps to prevent those infections going out of control. This is all cyst here. So we're getting closer to the main blood vessels to the, uh, to the spleen. This is probably the vein here. Nice plump full of blood. And then we take the major blood vessel to the spleen. These are titanium clips. So we're going to cut the artery here. You can see it pulsating there away with no blood coming out of it. That's always good. For this sort of surgery, you do have to get used to working in one area and looking in another. Uh, so having your hands working in one spot and looking at another spot. And so I always say that uh, the years I spent in the arcade are well spent. The, uh, the key to this sort of thing is slow and steady. We're not looking for any time records. And uh, you take your time and you do a good job. 
Let's have a look at the spleen again. And uh, we're just gradually going through it with the harmonic scalpel. And that should be it. Yeah, we've got it freed up. Generally, children are smaller. And as a result, there are spaces inside their body that we're working in, uh, such as in the chest or the abdomen, are much smaller. So the movements have to be a lot finer. And the instruments we use have to be a lot different. OK, put your finger in that hole. Do the little Dutch boy. OK, bag, please. Uh, we then put the spleen actually in a bag inside her tummy. Nice big bag. And then we sort of mash it up a little bit, take it out in bits. There it is. We did this all laparoscopically, and we took the spleen out through this size incision. Normally, for a splenectomy, you'd have an incision that big in order to uh, get this out, maybe a little smaller. Hopefully, she'll be able to go home tomorrow. We'll see. You know, six months from now, this will look like a little small scar uh, that she won't be too embarrassed about. So um, things went very well. Brandy's mom, come on out. We're all done. Oh, hi, how are you doing? Uh, everything went just fantastic. Great. Uh, couldn't have gone better, really. Premature babies can survive at smaller and smaller babies, younger and younger age. Probably around 23 weeks gestational age, so a normal uh, pregnancy is 40 weeks. Yeah. 20 years ago, it was difficult to ventilate these babies. Uh, they didn't have the right tubes. They didn't have these great ventilators that we do now. But there's always two sides to every coin. And as a result, you know, they survive, but some and many of them, especially the really tiny ones, have some deficits. Well, this baby's born premature, 27 weeks gestational age, so about three months premature. I was asked to see the baby because of abdominal distension and failure to pass any stool. I mean, a full-term baby, we usually like to see a bowel movement within the first 24 hours. When they're little, they, things don't tend to work, just like they have a difficulty time breathing. They also sometimes have a difficulty pooping. In this case, it's probably mainly because they're premature. And we often see a lot of babies like this just so that we're aware in case something should happen, such as, you know, the bowel perforate or something like that where we'd have to do something. Okay, I'm gonna go over to look at some x-rays. The baby's abdomen is quite distended from what you can see and also in this x-ray. There's lots of gas in these bowel loops. And I did a rectal irrigation yesterday with a little bit of saline, like a little enema, to see whether I could produce a bowel movement. Didn't have any effect. So you always got to worry, is there a, an actual blockage of some kind um, going on? Because otherwise, he looks pretty well. At this point, the baby seems stable. It's a matter of just waiting and seeing. I've always been physically active, always involved in sports. The good thing about jogging is it uh, allows me to focus better mentally. It sort of clears your head. If I have a difficult operation or an operation I know it's going to be more involved, I'll kind of rehearse it beforehand and what I want to happen. And I think that's not uncommon in surgeons. When they've got something that they're doing a little different, they'll kind of go through it in their head, try and anticipate problems, make sure they have the right instrumentation in order to do it. I got into med school when I was 19. I remember someone saying to me that they were going to be a cardiac surgeon in first year uh, med school, and I thought, like, who would want to be a surgeon? You know, they're jerks, and uh, I had this stereotype that, uh, in my mind, that, you know, they threw things and weren't nice to people. And I never really thought about it until we did 12 weeks of surgery, um, in which I found I just loved the process, and I really got hooked. Great, so we're doing fantastic. Okay, scissors. Scissors, please. What do you want? Scissors. Oh, did. Is that Alzheimer's kicking in? I'm taking my glasses. 
now. It's hard to work with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. <laughs> we like to have seriousness, but we also like to have a little bit of fun sometimes. And Dr. Walton is very good at that. He has a very dry sense of humor. He's serious when he needs to be serious, but uh, at times he can lighten up. <laughs> it's a fun atmosphere to work in. And, yeah. Dr. Walton's making comments in the background. Sarah, sorry, Sarah. Dr. Walton, I was being interviewed. <laughs> Sarah, can we bother you for a suture? I have to get Dr. Walton something now. Excuse me. <laughs> if I was a, a bit of a bastard and um, threw stuff and, you know, swore at the nurses and so on, I don't think they would want to work with me. So I try to generate an environment where people are happy to work with me. Um, they get joy out of treating kids and seeing them get better. This is a picture that my son did uh, of us playing street hockey in the driveway. So he's in, um, he's in goal, um, and I'm taking shots on him. And he's, he always says that he's ahead six to five, but I think I'm ahead six to five. So there's always a bit of a discussion there. So I always look at that one just to remind myself of uh, who I really am and what's important. We'll get that out in a couple of days. Okay. And then once she's comfortable. So you understand what's going to happen today, um, taking that part of the lung out where the, the cyst is. And uh, afterwards, you'll have a chest tube just to drain a little bit of fluid, a little bit of air. And then hopefully we'll get that out in, in a couple of days. When we had done an ultrasound, we had to do further tests. and. They found out that there was a cyst on her lung. When they had found it, they said it was about the size of a golf ball. So we were <laughs> we were pretty concerned about that. We were kind of thinking the worst initially. And originally told us there's 50% chance of survival. I think just Dr. Walton's approach with us, he's always been really laid back and easy going and not uptight, so. But yeah, there is, there. I am nervous and I've tried to keep, keep busy all week so that uh, my mind hasn't focused totally on the surgery and what's going to happen, so. Kisses for mom and kisses for dad. Lots of kisses. Mm, yeah. Okay, ma'am. All right, here we go. has is some pockets or cysts in her right side of her chest in her lung. On the right side there are three parts to the lung, the upper, middle and lower lobe. And this looks like it's, it's within the, uh, the lower lobe on the right side. What happens in over the long term is they can trap air and get bigger and bigger and bigger and then they press and squeeze the rest of the lung. Um, and they can, so that can cause problems with breathing and they can also get infected. And um, when they do get infected, it can be quite difficult to remove them because there's a lot of reaction. And long term, there can be uh, malignancies that develop down the road into a, a cancer. The takeoff and landing is the most critical part of anesthesia, although the whole thing's important, obviously. Technically, it's more challenging putting a very small baby to sleep because everything is smaller. You have to be more precise about the drug doses that you use because their blood volume is so small. You can be more meticulous about um, monitoring the blood loss so that she doesn't lose extraordinary amount of her blood volume. You know, for the next two or three hours as we do this operation, uh, Dr. Daly is going to be watching everything that happens, and we have a very close interaction. So she tells me to back off uh, in terms of s stop operating, and uh, then I do. Uh, and it's a very close relationship because we're physically not very separated over this small little little body. Anytime we operate on, on babies, the expectations are high. This baby is a normal baby, apart from this one area of the lung that's abnormal. And so the expectation is that she will live a long and happy life. So we're just making an incision, and then we're going to split some of the muscles there and deepen our way down into the chest. 
So why don't you take down part of your incision? Just a straight path there. I think the difference between pediatric surgeons and adult surgeons is adult surgeons are used to getting their hands inside of the chest or inside the abdomen when they operate, especially on open procedures. Well, clearly in this little girl, we can't do that because my hands are uh, as big as she is. And so you get used to working a lot with just using instruments inside the chest. So we're just selecting the inner space that we're gonna go through, and the inner space meaning the spot between the ribs, because uh, we go between ribs and spread them to get into the chest. So that's fifth rib, that's sixth rib. Yeah. Let's have the rib spreader, please. And this is like a little Lego rib spreader. For an adult, a rib spreader would be probably 10 times bigger than this. Good. So we're just gonna examine the lung now uh, and visually confirm where things are. Okay, let's get our uh, my retractor. Very pink, there's no smoking going on here. That is the uh, lower lobe. And it looks quite different than the other lung. It looks kind of white. So this is the abnormal part of the lung. And you can sort of see it going up and down quite nicely. So there's sort of this white area. And then if you look at other parts, there's some darker areas which are probably not as well aerated. So there's the right middle lobe. That's looking good. And this is all the right lower lobe. What we're doing is uh, mobilizing the, uh, or getting the right lower lobe uh, up and um, by dividing some of the attachments around the right lower lobe with the use of cautery, uh, which will minimize the amount of bleeding. So we have a significant amount of blood coming through these blood vessels that are feeding into the lung. And as a result, uh, there can be um, life-threatening blood loss that, you know, unstopped could lead to death. So what we're doing now is isolating each of these vessels, there's the arteries and the veins, to the lung, and uh, with the view that we can take them one by one and control them and not risk any bleeding. That's all we have left of the lung. So we're looking very good. And you can see, you know, everything looks nice and red, and but we're not losing, you know, we're not losing hardly any blood doing this. And the vein is down lower, but uh, that white thing right there is the bronchus, which is the breathing tube to the right lower lobe. So that's how the air gets in, carbon dioxide gets out, oxygen gets in. So we're actually in sort of the, the last stage of this operation. We've controlled the blood vessels uh, perfectly. Uh, we haven't lost a drop of blood. And now we're gonna go after the bronchus and then make sure it's airtight. See the, the action of the, there's two lobes remaining. This is the right upper lobe. That's the right middle lobe. And you can see as, as Dr. Daly is ventilating the uh, Lea, how that part of the lung is going up and down nicely. So we know we've got, we haven't heard any of the uh, breathing tubes to the right upper or the right middle lobe. So everything's looking golden. Uh, now we've placed a clamp across the, uh, the breathing tube or the bronchi to this part of the lung. And you can see now there's no air going in and out of it. So we're, um, we're then going to remove the right lower lobe. And then we're going to tie this and use a stitch on a needle to actually secure the closure of the breathing tube so we have no air leakage from this area. You can have the bakey, please. Okay, and there's a little low. And um, so we're gonna send that to the pathology and they're gonna start looking at it under the microscope and see what, what they see. Well, we're, uh, we're just finishing up here. Leah's done wonderfully. Uh, I think we did okay too, so we're all happy. Say hi to the camera, little Leah. Say I'm starving, but I feel a lot better.
fantastic. Uh, no problem at all. Um, she was a real trooper and behaved herself through the whole anesthetic. Um, saw the, the lung was clearly abnormal and we thought the rest of the lung looked fantastic and wonderful. Um, so we took out that part of the, the lung, the right lower lobe, and the right middle and right upper lobe looked great. She's looking like she wants to eat. She's chewing on her hand. And, yeah, so she looks like she's ready to eat. So um, what we'll do is we'll maybe take you over to to the ICU. You're your grandma? Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Walton. Hi. Nice to meet I you. Want to hug you. Oh, you're, you're allowed. I, I like hugs. <laughs> Hi. My dad. Grandpa? Yeah. Great. One of, one, of one of them. Okay. Well, we're just going to go down to uh, the ICU and I'll take you down to that waiting room and then as soon as they're ready, they'll get you in. Okay? Yeah, it went fantastic. Went very well. This is not a nine to five job. It's not a 37 and a half hour work week. It's double that. It's a very addicting job because you get a lot of uh, positive reinforcement. You know, you do good work, the kids do well, the parents are just wonderfully grateful for what can be done and people appreciate your efforts. So that's, that's a very nice thing, a very nice part of the, the whole process. And really, I, don't, I couldn't do anything else. I mean, you know, you could say I'm almost addicted to this, this work. Um, and uh, anyway, I gotta do three more operations and I'll talk to you later.